So welcome to the uh, symposium on uh, behavioral experiments in a natural setting. And this is, a, I'm Victor Nee, I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Economy and Society. And for years now, I've been noticing a important trend across the social sciences to take the well-known experimental design out of the university lab context to move it into the natural setting, into the field. And this is in part uh, driven by the question, are uh, undergraduates in elite universities where they have labs uh, representative of the world outside? Uh, of course, there are different positions on this, pro and con, but I think that question has been raised. And that the natural setting is more uh, as we would, uh, as society as it is, and with the context that influences social behavior outside of the university lab. So the challenge has been to move the classic ideas of the experimental design with treatments into the natural settings. And there are two major currents in this work. The lab in the field experiments, uh, which takes the ex experiment in its full design into the field. And uh, this has been led by economists, uh, where there is a payoff that is closer to what you would see in the natural setting where the experiments are done. And then another movement to take experiments into the field, uh, the field experiment. Uh, and this has been uh, very much uh, closer, more closely identified with sociology. Uh, but the effort really is to move it to the field with uh, the rigor and uh, of the scientific, the, the, uh, the experiment that one would conduct in the laboratory. Uh, and that is a tremendous challenge. It really is not easy to do in the field, uh, and especially because you have human subject concerns in the field that uh, are easier to deal with in the lab. So today we have a outstanding uh, group of present presenters and discussants I'd like to introduce quickly, and then we can move on to the symposium. First, we have uh, Haken Holm, who's a leader of the uh, experiment, behavioral experiments, taking the experiment into the field, uh, the lab in the field experiments. And he is a microeconomist, professor of economics at Loon University, and someone I've had the great pleasure to collaborate with for, for over a decade now in the lab in the field experiments. And his discussant is Felice Garib, who is a professor of sociology at Cornell University and who just joined us from Harvard University. We're delighted to have her in that she is a leader in uh, research on immigration, inequality, and, and, and economic sociology. Uh, and, uh, and it reflects a trend among social scientists to be interested in learning the methodology of the experiment in the field. Um, then we, our second speaker is Sig Siggy Lindenberg, uh, who is often visiting Cornell and giving talks. I won't have to introduce him very carefully, but he is a professor of cognitive sociology uh, at the University of Groningen and the Tilburg Institute of Economic Research. Um, and he has led the work in the, ex the experiment, uh, field experiments and has published uh, with uh, extensively using the field experiment as the framework of research. Um, and uh, I, I also want to add, just because I, I overlooked, I meant to say this, that Siggy is a fellow of the Center for the Study of Economies and Society and Haken Holm is our newest fellow uh, in the center. And our idea is to build a global center where we reach out to active participants in our intellectual work and production and events through our appointing outstanding people as fellows of the center. And then our, the discussant for uh, Siggy Lindenberg is uh, Ed, Ed Lawler who I don't need to introduce. Uh, he is a professor of sociology and industrial labor relations, the Catherwood uh, professor here at Cornell University, and uh, has been a very close uh, 
um, affiliate and of the Center for the Study of Economy and Society and very active and central to our intellectual life in sociology. Um, and the third presentation is by Case Kaiser, who's a, a teaching professor at the Groningen University and has done important work in uh, sustainability and environmental concerns and uh, adding this dimension of important policy in, in relevant work uh, in the field. Um, and his discussant is Frederick Andersen uh, from Lund University, Sweden. Uh, and he is uh, a, a distinguished young Swedish econometrician, uh, uh, but who has been uh, also part of a larger collaborative effort that I've been involved in, so Frederick. And let me not say more, and uh, each of the presenters will present in about 45 minutes. Um, the, and then there will be followed by a discussion, which will, who will take 10 to 15 minutes, and an open discussion, and an hour per talk. Uh, and we conclude at five. Well, uh, thanks for the very nice introduction, uh, Victor, and I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, and um, today I, uh, I will uh, speak about um, a, a paper that we started out with uh, some time ago. Uh, and it's, uh, we call it now, strategic decisions and behavioral difference between CEOs and others. And it's a collaboration between uh, Victor, Sonia Opper at Lund University, and myself. Uh, so um, I will make this presentation based on a number of questions about uh, uh, what we are doing and why we are doing it. And, and I hope that the message is coming through by that. So the first question is then, why is it interesting to know if CEOs uh, uh, differ from others in strategic decision making? Well, uh, I think that there are many, but at least three uh, important things stand out to me, especially as an economist, I would say. So uh, they might, these, these are important persons in, in most economies. Uh, they have economic impact and, and what they do uh, uh, might also impact others, and if they, they, they might affect uh, what we would call a soft institution uh, by norms and by, by uh, and, and, and also actually uh, more formal institutions that they could actually affect policies by lobbying and so on. Uh, another uh, issue is, of course, uh, as an economist, we are, we are developing theories about economic, important economic agents. And um, we have done, of course, we do a lot of empirical studies about firms, for instance, but these studies are not so directly linked to the underlying theories. Uh, so what I would call the internal validity of some of these studies is not that high. Uh, so, and what we have done, where well, the internal validity is high, is to have undergraduate students, as Victor uh, said, playing certain games where the theoretical predictions are very crisp and clear. Uh, but the problem is, of course, it's not undergraduates that take decisions in firms, it's CEOs. So that is natural to see, do these act basically as what we know the undergraduate students do and how others would do. So that would be more or less, does theory in some sense work if we make the lab setting more realistic? Uh, and, uh, and when it comes to business ethics research, I mean, we will ask questions about whether or not uh, CEOs are more, uh, have a higher tendency to choose certain strategies that, that we can consider as optimal from, the, from society's point of view. Uh, that is, are, do they actions that are more or less pro-social than others? And, and then, then uh, I would say that, that the jury is out when it comes to the business ethics literature. Uh, there is one, one bright side and one darker side. And to illustrate this, I mean, this is not the, about global business tycoons, our subject group, but just to take somebody that we know, uh, we have a bright picture of, of one of the most famous CEOs, the former CEOs in, in US, 
when he is out helping uh, uh, children in Africa through his uh, uh, generous foundation. And then there is the brighter one, the, dark, or the, the darker one, of course. Uh, and this it was uh, one of the hearings when, when Microsoft was uh, accused of, of, um, of abuse of dominance, actually, when they uh, added on certain browsers to, to, the, to their, their, their um, Windows program. So, and he appeared rather arrogant in these hearings and, 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 um, and was considered perhaps not so nice at those uh, occasions. Okay, so why may there be differences uh, and what are the channels then between CEOs and others? All right. So, um, I can, th I think that in, in there might be, I mean, there are many possible stories behind why there can be differences. Uh, I have selected two that is mainly related to game theory, where I, I basically come from to a certain extent. And, and one, and, and we will actually study the game, a game here. So that is why it's natural to use some kind of game theoretical setting to, to discuss this. Uh, and one mechanism is simply uh, that uh, CEOs, they are selected in a sense to their positions to make good decisions. And they are playing these, if we think that they are playing some kind of games that we can capture by our experiments, then as an owner or uh, uh, for survival reasons, there would be a selection of those strategies that are so-called evolutionary stable. Now, Evolutionary stable strategies coincide with a set of Nash equilibrium strategies. So if, uh, from a purely evolutionary game theoretical perspective, uh, uh, the Nash strategies would actually win in the end. And, and you would like to have those that survive in this game. If you se should select a strategy or should, should select a type playing a certain game, then you should have the nation, according to that perspective. But if we dig a little bit deeper in this literature, um, there are uh, models of evolutionary game theory also, where if the matching is somewhat assortative, that means that it's not purely random who you will meet when you next time play a game, then actually you can have uh, cooperative strategies. That these strategies, if we take prisoner's dilemma, cooperative strategies that would be actually evolutionary stable. So if it's sufficiently high probability that I might meet my own type, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it could be actually evolutionary stable to be cooperative. And that, this has been shown theoretically. And, and that would mean that by being cooperative, you would actually favor your own group in the long run. And that is something that, that, um, that also could actually be something uh, we can think that, that that would actually be something that would favor the CEOs of being cooperative. So I'm just saying what I want to do with this, not saying that we have a directional hypothesis, but saying that there are different possible mechanisms out there. Um, yeah, and, and what we're saying here is that the basic auxiliary assumption is here that these mechanisms are probably weaker outside the, the tough private capitalistic environment. Do you have a reason for that? Well, uh, I mean, if you have, a, I mean, you have arguments way back in the 50s of. Uh, evolutionary processes in economics. Firms, I mean, if you look at firms, the survival, medium survival rate in many markets would be three to four years. It's extreme a selection. Uh, I would say that um, that would be one reason why, why, why you would have uh, these kind of forces. Uh, and in economics, I don't think that this would, would be uh, especially uh, strange belief. I think that that cap, I mean, if you have a more rigid system, of course, you don't have an obvious selection process. 
All right. So there are also money, given that we only focus on differences here, I just want to, to, to state it clearly that, that uh, uh, we could have at least two broad channels here. And one is the selection, of course. So specific types are more likely to become CEOs. The other would be some kind of nurture or transformation. When you're a CEO, you, you learn certain types of behavior that somehow are favored. Uh, and uh, so this would then be some kind of selection process where you have some kind of choice. So the green ones would be, for, for instance, the cooperative strategies in the prisoner's dilemma, the red ones defect. And here we see that for some reasons in the choice, the greenish one end up as CEOs in private sector. And the red ones end up. That is one possible process, of course. Another is survival. That is the classical uh, evolutionary process. So you, for some reason, the red strategy doesn't survive uh, and the proportion of green increases. So if this, if this process is somewhat more, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more um, uh, uh, there is more of this kind of process in, 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 in among CEOs, then, then you would have see a higher proportion of the green ones. But there could also be some kind of transformation that if you start, start to do these businesses and so on, somehow you turn out to be green. For, for whatever reasons that might be. Okay, so, so it's then, the reason I showed you these pictures was, was just to, to, to say that we do not exclude any of these channels. What we are after is to take this first step to see if there are differences, uh, if there are differences. And then as a natural second step, it would be, well, what could the mechanism be? And that would be, of course, uh, relatively tough. Um, so, uh, let me say something about what has been done and how do we contribute in this paper. Um, uh, out there, uh, especially in the business research, you will find a lot of questionnaire-based studies where you ask CEOs and others uh, and try to uh, uh, somehow describe them in various ways and, and capture different aspects, for instance, psychological aspects. And it could be related to agreeableness, extraversion, need for achievements, and a lot of studies like that. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of, there is also a, a literature on non-strategic risk taking, comparing CEOs and others. But there are very few studies where you have incentivized uh, strategic decisions and um, where we have real CEO, a real business person that actually runs some kind of uh, 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 firms that of some size, where it's possible also to identify core economic concepts. That is, and the core concepts in, in, in strategic games would be Nash equilibrium and efficiency. So that is what we are aiming at to contribute by, by having that. So the, the papers I've found that actually do something like what we are doing here is very few. And um, now you will probably have difficulties in C, but uh, it's like a 10 paper, about 10 papers, something like that. Uh, and it's, it's not that it's CEOs all the time, but it's sometimes it's four men in China. Uh, sometimes it's executive MBA students in US. And uh, yeah, so, so there is, there is uh, a, a lot of professionals and, and, and some managers as well. And what the typical comparison group is students, undergraduate students. Um, and they have the different games they study. And what is typical here, if you look at the frame, A is for abstract frame and F is for a field frame where you tell you give some indication of a more concrete situation. So most are abstract frame, and no of these studies do real belief elicitation. That is asking the subjects what they believe that the others would do, and so on. And the sampling in all of these uh, studies, except for actually uh, previous studies that we had, 
uh, is non-random. So it's convenience sample. They go to a conference, for instance, for CEOs, and then, and in this case, for instance, Fair Unleashed, they, had, they went to uh, uh, a coffee industry meeting in Colombia, where they took coffee uh, firm CEOs to compare them with students. You will also see that the number of uh, subjects is very low. So we hope to contribute by, by in several dimensions by, by uh, the following uh, stars, stuff. So if you look at the, what I said, it's, it's a single game, most of the other stars, the selection of CEOs are, are somewhat um, uh, non-random, and they often use students as, as subjects, uh, comparison groups. Um, okay. So what we do is, is the following. We um, uh, link our, uh, our, our behavior to theoretical construct, as I said, and we exclude insignificant business leader. That is what we take it as those that have uh, 10 or less employee. We have a random stratified sample, and we have a relatively large sample, and we have uh, elicitations of beliefs, and we have a comparison group, not as students. The reason I think is relatively easy. I mean, if, if for instance, students are different from ordinary people, and CEOs are similar to ordinary people, then you would find significant effects, but that is because students are different, not be because CEOs are different. Therefore, you need to have a good comparison group that are more similar to the CEOs. Okay, so, yeah, first of all, if, yeah, okay, let's talk about the games and, and the theoretical concepts first. So we use uh, a number of very simple games that I will show you soon. Uh, and we will have an abstract frame and a field frame. And then we will ask the people, or the, the subjects, how many do you think would play a certain strategy in each of the games. The theoretical conceptualization here is Nash equilibrium, as I said. And then we also have what we call the efficient strategy, and that is the socially optimal symmetric strategy. I will sh so, uh, show you soon. So the games we have is the prisoner's dilemma, which I think most of you know, the battle of the sexes, and chicken. And the payoff is as follows. So you can choose in prisoner's dilemma, you can defect, defect, or you can, and then you get 100 each, or you can cooperate, then you get substantially more. This is in Chinese uh, Yuan, uh, remnant bees. Uh, and um, so this is actually the money they played about. And I will describe later on uh, more about that. Battle of the sexes is where you can choose either a more aggressive strategy. It's a coordination game, but it's, uh, it's important that you actually coordinate on a certain. So if you choose hawk, the other guy needs to choose dove to earn anything at all. Uh, but the aggressive strategy here is hawk, which is if you get that equilibrium, that is the one you prefer because you get, get more. You have also chicken game, which is down here. It has a more asymmetric uh, payoff structure. So this is basically picking up different uh, aspects of strategic decision making, namely cooperation, it takes up coordination, takes up an anti-coordination situation. And we believe that all of these, and we're motivated to pay, pay, is, is important for strategic decision making in firms. Uh, in the field frame, we tr try to describe uh, a business-like situation to the participants before we show them the payoff table. And in this case was the example of chicken. We described it as, okay, a firm can choose whether or not to expand their businesses to a new region. And that would make that they would earn more, but they have a competitor that is in, in exactly the same situation. So if that firm also invests, then you will not earn anything because the market, uh, the new market has not capacity for more than one firm. And uh, so, we uh, actually randomize between those who get the field frame and the, the, the abstract frame. Okay, so the theoretical categorization is, is as follows, that we 
calculate, of course, the Nash equilibrium, and we calculate the, the social optimal symmetric strategies. And as you see in the prisoner's dilemma, Nash equilibrium say not cooperate. That is the prediction. But the social optimum is that, to, that everybody uh, plays cooperative. Uh, battle of the sexes, this is, uh, there you have pure strategy equilibria. But since they cannot coordinate, it means that we ca they cannot do anything about this situation more than to choose uh, an own coordinated uh, mixed strategy. That is what is to be expected in that case. And in that case, you have a unique mixed equilibria, which would mean to play hawk with probability 0.6. The symmetric optimal strategy is somewhat uh, where you should play ha hawk a little bit uh, with a lower probability. Chicken, you have also a similar situation with a make unique mixed strategy equilibrium and then a different social optimum. So we have tried to get crisp equilibrium predictions before we, we start and, and look at behavior. Uh, yeah, so. And we, since we talk of this, is, there is no possibility to coordinate here. It means that it will, it's natural to believe that it's a symmetric uh, e equilibrium that we will end up in. All right, so this is just the social optimal payoff uh, function. If both players play, the uh, play cooperation with a certain probability. So the more more, the higher probability you, pay, uh, uh, you, you play cooperation, the higher uh, expected profit. Here, if you don't have any coordination possibilities, this is the relevant line. So the optimum would be here somewhere, uh, 0.5, right? And we have the same with chicken, but there it's the optimal is just a 0.2, uh, probability 0.2. All right, so our hypotheses are very simple. We, we simply, uh, we elicit beliefs and we look at actions. So the first hypothesis is that there is no difference between COs and other, that's a null hypothesis. And, and the, the second hypothesis is that, uh, that there are no differences in beliefs between the COs and, and uh, others. So how did, did we do this? Now, if, if we could dream as researchers, I would, I would collect uh, 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 like 100,000 identical twins. Then I would take 50,000 and put them as uh, CEOs in, in a lot of firms around the world, uh, all countries around the world. And then I will let the other 50,000 not be CEOs, but get into other uh, occupations and so on. Now, now we are not in, in that position, I'm afraid. So what we do then is, of course, to try to manage as good as we can. And, and we do this by, by this comparison group approach that, that has been done in the literature before. There are other ways to do this, but uh, we think this is one approach if you want to have a high internal validity. Okay, so we use 200 CEOs uh, recruited in, in, in the Jiangxi Delta from two different uh, cities in China. Uh, we use this stratified random sample, so we use from different types of firm, the most common firm. We also uh, stratify according to firm size. And we have then 200 individuals in the control group, 100 from each city, that live in uh, and have an education that are similar to the CEOs, so that we don't get these, uh, a very different group. And we also match them according to gender. Uh, and then we have this army of research assistants that we trained and sent out to, to uh, uh, firms. And the whole point of this is to get these busy people, you have to be prepared to take pains. And this is, you make, it, you make an appointment with the CEO, he, he and the assistant go there, and, and then the CEO had to go to Beijing. Okay, go back, call them again, new appointment. This is the way you have to do in order to get reasonable uh, uh, 
number of, of uh, participants. So, and so the assistant visited uh, the CEOs at their firms to reduce their cost of participating. So this is, this is that uh, a pilot study. And uh, this is the uh, pilot study, first, uh, I think one of the first CEOs that he is in, in one of, of, he was in the pretest of, of this uh, study. Okay, so let me say something, because we did this in China, and we always get questions, well, China is a specific case and so on, but, uh, and I'm definitely not a, an expert on China, but I will try to do my best to, to give you brief, some brief information about, about this. So it's a unique history, of course, but it's a relatively short um, history of the private sector. So that means that we don't have a lot of firms where, where the CEOs have inherited their positions, but in these private firms, they have really worked hard to gain it, usually. Uh, so in the context, our study in the context of, 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 of recent development in China, it would be something like this. Before 78, it's mostly red. And then we have a person, Deng Xiaoping, he arrives. And then after this, he opens up for private sectors. And so we have some private entrepreneurships that are allowed, the, the greenish one. And this goes on with the bottom-up processes and the private sector expands. And when we go in, in the last wave here that I will present, then we make a sampling. We take out the, the CEOs and then we have some other. Now the color should be more like brownish, right, around. But that is basically what we do in 2012. Some other additional content, uh, comments is that China today is the largest economy in, in, in uh, uh, purchasing power uh, uh, terms. And that means if you should do a study like this and you can only choose uh, one country, why don't do it in the largest one? Uh, the other thing that is somewhat practical is that, that when you do economic experiments, it would be extremely expensive to do that in, in, China, in Sweden or US, for instance, because we want to have some kind of significant incentives that it should at least be felt a little bit that there are money involved. Now, the median family income in our sample for a reasonable successful CEO is 75,000 US dollars. And, and that, is, that is not extremely much, um, but it's much in China still. Uh, and we, that means that when we pay our subject, we can actually give incentives uh, uh, that should be felt a little bit. So we give them about $40 for a task that took 18 minutes. And that would correspond to $120 an hour, which, which should be, it's, a, it's, it's at least a, a substantial incentive compared to many studies on, on undergraduate start, uh, students and so on. Okay, so let's come to the findings then. All right, first of all, something about some of our matching results, and that is, uh, here we see that the, the gender structure, it's 84%, 85% CEOs are male. And we were able to match that pretty well in the control group. The age was 45, 46 in the in MOCOs, it was a little bit lower in the control group. The income of the family, not much to do about, but it was 400,000 uh, uh, renminbi for CEOs and it was 175 for, for, for the control group. And here I should say that we did a previous study, we would just had random sample of households and then it was, the control group had like 50,000. So we, this is a substantial improvement compared to before. And we will of course control for income when we do our regressions and so on. So, and then we had years in school, that was a pretty good match. And then the number of observation was 199 and 200 because we had one CEOs for coordination problems. He dropped. There was one dropping out. Okay. So what about the behavior when they choose? What would be? 
what would be, um, and, and here I will show you the percentage of CEOs and the control group in the different games, whether they played defect or hawk. So this PDA, it means that the prisoner's dilemma game with abstract frame, that was randomized, abstract frame to the subject. So we have about half got an abstract frame and half got a field frame. Now, so if we look at the first with, with the group that got the abstract frame and compare the, these with the, with the control group, we see that there's significantly higher uh, play of hawk behavior uh, among the CEOs. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, there's much more cooperation among the CEOs compared to the control group. And that is a significant result. Also in the field frame, those that got the field frame, we have significant higher cooperation rates, and lower uh, defect rate among CEOs compared to the control group. And if we continue here, in, in, in the battle of the sexes game, we have significant differences. More hawkish behavior among non-CEOs, less hawkish uh, among CEOs. The same with chicken, more hawkish or more aggressive behavior non, in the non-CEOs uh, compared to the CEOs. Okay, so if we look at this, this theoretical construct that we had, so how is there any consistency in the pattern here? Well, if we look at the Nash equilibrium, we know that the Nash equilibrium was to defect all the time in prisoners of lemma. So the difference from the sub uh, from the, the the Nash equilibrium and for the different groups was of course how long far they were from from uh, playing zero that is they didn't defect and that you see that here the, the CEOs are f further away from the Nash equilibrium in prisoner's dilemma. But the reverse is true actually for chicken. And then they're closer, uh, then they're further away again for Nash, uh, for the chicken. So it seems like the Nash equilibrium prediction in that respect is not consistently uh, uh, predicts our results. Uh, what about the difference to the social optimal symmetric strategy? He would see that uh, CEOs, they are closer to the social optimal strategy in prisoner's dilemma, in chicken, in battle of the sexes, and in chicken. So there is a consistent pattern according to the theoretical um, concepts here, which seems that uh, that is consistent with the CEOs being oriented towards efficiency. And this has, of course, important aspects of their expected earnings. So this is an illustration uh, with the earnings. If I take the probabilities of the populations of their play and I pair two of these together, then you will see these differences. And you see consist consistently for all gains, CEOs earn more. And we, this is not like we uh, let them go out and do business on the street, but this is like taking an abstract game and they earn simply more. Um, and that is not just for one game, but it's for all. What about beliefs? I said that we elicited the beliefs. We said, all right, now guess how many played defect in the game you played before. And we pay you the closer you are to the true value. So that was incentivized. And here we see that also, relatively many games, they differed in behavior. Uh, and here we see that uh, we had the beliefs was also less, less uh, more cooperative beliefs among CEOs, less among uh, the control group. And we also have beliefs about less hawkish behavior in Battle of the Sexes, but that is not significant in the abstract frame, only in the field frame. And in chicken, we had significant differences and that less hawkish beliefs among CEOs. Uh, and what is consistent here again is that the average deviation from believing in the social symmetric optimal strategy is also consistently 
the beliefs are closer here to the social open mind. So it's not only that they play differently, they actually believe it also. Um, and and um, uh, so it makes somewhat of a relatively consistent story in that respect. So, and we also check for accuracy of beliefs, thank you, and we see that here we have, here we have, when we look at the group, at, at th this group, how close they were to the actual play of themselves, we see that the CEO, since s at least when there was a significant difference, the CEOs were, were better at getting what the other were doing. Then we do robustness tests um, because uh, we, had, we had a control group interviewed in their home and it could be that it's the fact that you're in a different locations that could affect uh, the behavior. It could also be that the CEOs, they knew that they were playing against other CEOs and that could create an in-group effect because they're still a more exclusive group. Uh, if we look at previous res research when it comes to these effects specifically close to what we were doing, we didn't believe that this would actually have an effect. But the strongest evidence we have that this is actually not the case is that we, by serendipity, I would say, we had in the control group, we detected that uh, 43 persons of these, they were actually enterprise director in the private sector. So they were actually CEOs, to, in, but we didn't check that they were, they probably didn't have 10 employees. They probably have perhaps were self-employed of their own firm or that they, they had fewer. So we run all regressions again. I haven't shown you regressions tests, but we did that uh, with this group as well. And in principle, all results were remained robust. And this is with much fewer uh, uh, subjects. So that, that seemed to convince us that, that the results were, were uh, okay. And we also run robustness tests for extreme values, interviewer effects, owners. If we redefine the CEO to founders of a firm or owners of a firm, and we, the results more or less came through. Um, so, the conclusion would be then that the CEOs are significantly more cooperative and less hawkish than the control group. They are closer to the social optimal symmetric strategy. Uh, their beliefs about their opponents are significantly cl closer also to these optimal uh, symmetric strategies. Uh, and they are more, the CEOs are more accurate with respect to their own group's behavior than the control groups. They are a question mark because uh, it didn't pass one of the rob robustness tests that we did. So that's this loss, that's the reason for the question mark. But uh, our conclusion then is that the private business leaders may be important in the development of, of efficient institutional economic transitions. There, there are differences, so now it's to understand why it's like that and what mechanism drives it. Okay. Thank you so much for including me on this panel. So let me start by saying that I find this project really, really ambitious. Um, first, the authors have picked a group that's notoriously hard to study, the CEOs who don't have time for researchers. Second, they have picked this non-local setting, China, and I'm sure that introduces tons of logistical issues. It requires cultural language competency. So they've overcome all these difficulties and they've been able to obtain a large sample. So we have nearly 200 CEOs and nearly 200 individuals who are sociodemographically similar to CEOs. And finally, we have not just one strategic uh, decision game, but we have three incentivized strategic games. So this is all above and beyond the literature. We also have both an abstract framing and a field framing of the same questions to discard any possible um, effects. And we also have belief elicitation, so we know what the participants believe to be others' uh, beliefs. So kudos for all this effort, which gives us the largest study of its kind to date. So what we learned from this study also shows that it's, it was worth all this effort. So counter to what I would expect, and perhaps many of us, we 
uh, would expect in this room, we see that CEOs are actually not more likely to act in this narrowly self-serving manner compared to the control subjects. In fact, they're more likely to act in socially optimal ways, so in ways that maximize collective benefits while also improving or serving individual interests. And this result is consistent across all of these games. So this is uh, great. And why this might be surprising, I thought to myself, so sociologists for a while have been writing about performativity. So basically the idea is that economics, by providing tools like formulas or models, can make economic actors more likely to act in line with those models. Uh, so it brings about the behavior in actors. And now we're looking at top economic actors in these firms, and we actually don't see that. The opposite, we see that the CEOs in this study seem to be more adapted to presumably real-life situations where pro-social behavior is more likely to be rewarded than this idealized competitive market where you need to be kind of narrowly or maximally self-serving. So I want to pull out the bigger picture a little bit and also go beyond the study perhaps. So what we see in this paper is an answer to the question, uh, which, which is an important question, are there differences between CEOs and others uh, in strategic decision making, making? And the answer is yes. But another question we can ask is why, and the study actually could go into that question, I think. So why is it important to ask this question? Because I think it can allow us accumulate, uh, it can allow the results to accumulate something larger and more generalizable. For example, even in this study, we see small variations across games. So it makes a difference if the CEOs are playing the prisoner's dilemma versus the chicken game, right? And we also, if you look at the literature, we also see differences across studies. So why do we observe these differences and how can we make sense of these differences? And what we need to focus, in my opinion, is basically the theoretical mechanisms creating these differences. And this way we can apply the same mechanism to different contexts and generalize to something more than China, to something more than CEOs. Now, how do we get at these mechanisms? Uh, Hakan mentioned that it's incredibly difficult. It is. Uh, the question is, can we make this kind of the subject of our field experiments? In other words, design field experiments to elicit these theoretical mechanisms rather than just identifying differences, or can we combine these field methods with alternative methods in order to better uh, get at these questions? Now, one in this study, for example, one lingering question is what makes the CEOs different? Why do they go about their decisions differently? So one idea is selection. They're inherently different, different kinds of individuals who have these qualities about decision making, making end up being CEOs, or is it about learning on the job? So you become a CEO and through experience you gather this knowledge and that affects your behavior. Now, um, the authors actually get at this partially because they can control for the experience, the tenure as a CEO. So how long have you been a CEO? And when they include this in the model, it has an effect, but it doesn't completely wipe out the differences between the CEOs and the control subjects. So this is really uh, interesting. So I'm wondering if we can push this idea a little uh, bit further and trying to come up with a more stringent test for how much experience matters. And I thought about this kind of 40-some individuals who are like CEOs in many other ways. So basically, we can think about uh, set up like a regression discontinuity design, where you're trying to find individuals who, are, who could have been CEOs if not for minor differences. So in this sample, we have the CEO sample, and we have the sample in the control group who have similar responsibilities to CEOs. So what if we compare these two groups? Does this wipe out some of the selection effects and then we can see if it's about experience or not? So that's kind of one idea. The other idea is that there's a very interesting finding that CEOs are more kind of able to, are able to more accurately guess what other CEOs believe than the general population is able to guess what others believe. So they're better at kind of identifying the norms, if you can kind of interpret that uh, as such. Now, can we use this? Can we use this deviation from the correct guess as a predictor of uh, behavior, basically included in the model? So if you're able to understand the norms, does that affect your choices? So again, this gives us kind of more leverage in understanding, um, understanding what mechanism uh, is underlying uh, the observed effects. And there's some actually findings coming out of sociology that show um, 
particularly Peter Behrman, a Columbia sociologist, did this recent study where they found that people who were highly regarded in a social network more, were more savvy about other people's positions in the network. So they could read the social structure better. So is this the case with the CEOs as well? So are these the people who are minimally deviant from the correct guesses that are kind of involved in this cooperative, socially efficient behavior. So these ideas, I don't know if they'll work, but they involve using existing data to better kind of get at uh, the mechanism. An entirely different strategy, and this is another study perhaps, is to follow up this experimental setup, perhaps with some qualitative data collection. So asking these CEOs, did they always have the same strategy? Did they learn through past mistakes? Do they face pressures to conform? Uh, to a given norm. And there's actually a movement in social psychology. Um, Elizabeth Palak from Princeton, I think, is a proponent of that. She's written about this, about combining field experiments with qualitative data collection to better get at not just whether differences exist, but actually why uh, they're there. So I don't want to push too far in the why question. I know it's beyond the scope. And you've already done so much. Until now, we did not even know if these differences between CEOs and others uh, were real. Uh, so kudos to the authors for providing answers. And I'm looking forward to seeing the future work. So our second presentation will be by. Oh, OK. So, sorry. Go ahead. We have I, I, my mistake. Yes, yes. Uh, and, um, thanks for the for, uh, 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 presentation of a great, great study and uh, the very astute uh, comments. I have a question with regard to uh, this type, uh, possible type selection. Uh, if you would have games where the CEOs play with non CEOs, so this is now the same, same, same group, so are they? Social type, do they just have social preferences that play out to, uh, to others? Or is it really uh, having social preferences with regard to, uh, to their own, uh, to their own uh, uh, group? So you were talking in the beginning about that. I, I know there are these 43, but I, I, I go with your suggestion to really see that, uh, that um, the dark side, uh, we, we, we know that uh, there are many firms that are led by CEOs where actually the customers that are clearly non-CEOs, but they are a specific other group. They are not just a general uh, audience. Uh, uh, other, are the ones that make me a CEO earn money. And so there is, of course, a conflict uh, of a different type uh, going on with the customer. And they don't belong to my group. And my question would be, what would you think if you would uh, just continue this study now with, uh, with uh, uh, CEOs versus non-CEOs or CEOs uh, more specifically with regard to, uh, to uh, uh, possibly conflicting uh, interest groups? Uh, in the, the, the same vein would be to ask, would there not be other uh, occupations, professions that would follow the same pattern that you think, because now you say it's CEOs most of all, but uh, if you take, uh, I don't know, uh, teachers, uh, would that not be, uh, would that not work that way? Uh, if you take lawyers, but, uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, just first and, and, and thanks for a very good comment and I've written them. Uh, but yeah, the, I mean, first answer is that when you, we have actually that game when they play against this control group. So, so uh, I believe that it's something deeper. It's probably social preferences or something like driving results. It's not just that they play against another CEO. Uh, concerning other professions, there are some studies. For instance, nurses seem to cooperate more in prisoners than they have been. Uh, but uh, I mean, we are now we are di doing this study on, in China on, on private entrepreneurs, so it's it has been natural for us to ask that question. But it's it's there is that, quite that I understand. But you also yes. had an hypothesis that CEOs are just uh, um, doing this more than non CEOs, yes. and so my my question was then why do you assume that? And then among the non CEOs would be other 
groups such as the nurses, teachers, lawyers, whatever, who may have similar selection processes or socialization processes going on. Yeah, I think it's I think it's this evolutionary process that it is hard competition for firms. So that that would be my question. I don't know. Yes, you have. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, very uh, interesting results. Uh, my, my question is about uh, whether the, whether you intend for this to be thought of as an experiment, because it, it doesn't involve randomized trials, and I generally use the word experiment as if randomized trials is implied by that term. Uh, I suppose you, you don't have to, you could use an experiment in, in another way, but since there are not randomized trials here, I, I would be reluctant to say it, it's an experiment. I mean, randomized trials would be impossible here. You would have to randomly assign these, these people to be CEOs and random yeah. and assign these to be not, and then you, you have an experiment, but it would be impossible. The prisoner's dilemma and other games have been widely used as measurement tools because it's a wonderful way to measure how cooperative a person is, how, how they're going to behave in ways that would be hard to do with, with your typical sort of belief item, Likert scale approach. And so in that sense, I think of this as a measurement study that uses survey methods and, and uses a, a game theoretic measurement tool combined with survey methods of stratified random sampling, but doesn't involve randomized trials. So I would think of it as just a, a, a very interesting survey. Well, I, I think you, I don't agree, uh, uh, because first of all, there are randomized, uh, the field and abstract frame is totally randomized. What, what so it's, randomized? Uh, the field and abstract frame it's, it's totally uh, randomized. The order is totally randomized. So it's definitely in that uh, formal sense, if that is your definition of an experiment, it's an experiment. But I would say that I would not agree with your definition of an experiment because uh, often you have point predictions, for instance. And here we have a theoretical construct structs where we have crisp point predictions in the game, what should happen. And then you do a study where you actually put all your efforts in doing a situation that, that is close to the theoretical predictions. That is normally a point prediction experiment. That is, you create this artificial situation and you have a point prediction. So I know that some use a more narrow definition of experiments. I'm fine with that, but that's not my definition. I would say that, for instance, when, when, when Einstein did, did his study of, of uh, the lights bending because of the magnetic field around the, the, the moon, uh, many call that an experiment. Um, so I, I, I think it's... It's different definitions, but yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I would push back really quickly that, yeah. that, that I, I think the abstract versus uh, field framing is more of, isn't more of a robustness check. It's not your central hypothesis you're trying to test. The key yeah. hypothesis is difference between CEOs and non-CEOs where you don't have yeah. to analyze right. right. No, I'm, so I'm, I'm definitely, I mean, if you like to call this a survey, I'm, as long as you think it's a good survey. <laughs> <laughs> a very good survey. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, we still have time. Okay, thank you.